Hey everyone, it's Amanda from the San Diego Lifestyle and I'm so thrilled today to be getting to bring on someone really, really inspirational that I've been watching a ton of on TV. So lately my family and I have been binge watching this show called Naked and Afraid on the Discovery Channel. So if you haven't ever seen it, they basically usually put a man and a woman out in some very remote, crazy part of the world and they basically take, they have no food, they have no water, and and they take them out there for 21 days to see if they can survive. Usually these people are survivalists in real life, so they've done a lot of hunting or fishing, and they kind of know what's going on, but sometimes the diseases or the animals or the bugs, the ants, just get to these people way too much, and they have to what is called tap out on the show, and they have the crew come in and basically take them back home. So not only did our guest today survive all 21 days of his challenge but on the very last day when he was paddling out in a boat with his partner to the final boat that takes them home they actually ran into they did a two-day extraction and they did they ran into another group of survivalists who were on a show called Naked and Afraid XL which is where the contestants go out for 40 days and 40 nights so if you can imagine that it's a whole group of people so I guess it's a little easier but I would not say it's easy at all all and Chance here, Chance Davis is with me today and he survived all 21 days. He met this other group and actually decided to stay another 19 nights in the jungle. So I couldn't believe it. Yes, he's a military ve veteran. Yes, he knows a ton about being outside in the wilderness, but being naked, afraid, and only with one item, that is just so crazy. So welcome Chance today to the show. I'm so happy to have you. Well, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> so I have to ask, when you were literally hours away from a warm blanket, a buffet of food, what made you decide to stay another 19 nights in the jungle? Uh, for me, it was about the challenge. I kind of knew they started asking questions. Would you stay longer if you had the opportunity? And kind of knew where they were going with it. It was about not day 19 when they started asking. And uh, I've always enjoyed challenging myself physically, mentally, put myself in situations and really testing my uh, abilities and what I've learned and putting it to whatever fire I could. And uh, that's more or less why I stayed. I mean, I was in a bad situation kind of leaving a relationship and moving cross country. And I just done that shortly before the show. Um, so discovery offered a free hiking trip and all the food that you can gather and, and hunt. So it was an easy choice. <laughs> that's crazy. I cannot say most people would say that's an easy choice. I mean, the night that you, so you actually met up with this group of other people and then that whole night were you thinking, what am I thinking? Like, was there any moments where you're like, I'm going to starve out here? Can I actually last 40 days? Like, how mentally do you go all in and make the choice to really say, this person's going to leave me tomorrow and I'm going to stay here another 19 days? Oh, when you're out there, you're so far removed from everything. I mean, there's no Wi-Fi, there's no bills, there's no drama at work. I mean, so you have the struggle of being tired, no caffeine, no sugar, and but you have the simplicity of being out there. It's beautiful. Uh, it's quiet when the howler monkeys aren't screaming at you in the morning. Um, I really enjoyed being out there. We kind of, in the group, termed it as beautiful suffering. I mean, there were days where I'd just walk out in the jungle for a couple hours and lay in the big, thick, mossy patch and look up at the jungle canopy and just feel blessed rather than soak in the struggle. Um, wow. and that paddle. So on day 20, we were on a raft and we paddled from morning till evening to meet up with the group. And, uh, you don't really think about much else. I mean, you have Cayman and Anaconda in the river below you and you're just paddling, trying to get to this next destination. In the military, we always talked about having your next target. So your 25 meter target, then your 50 meter target. And, uh, that was kind of how it was in the jungle. You didn't really think about day 21 or day 40. You think about today and you think about tomorrow and that's it. Um, 
Wow. And then that day you actually went with her to paddle out. I couldn't believe that. So you actually said, I'm going to stay with the group another 19 days. And then you actually paddled out with her to the boat, watched her get on a boat, watched her say, I'm done. I'm free. I get to go back and eat all this food. And then you paddled back all the way alone to meet this group. Did you have any worries at that point? No, I, I really felt strong on day 20, uh, day 21. We, we forged a lot of food while we were out on the beginning of the challenge. We ate good. We had a lot of piranha. You know, once we started understanding the lay of the land and where to hunt, where not to hunt. Uh, so I felt strong on day 21. Both of us did. I knew that she, uh, she had a family circumstance and I was more or less why she had to go home. So I wasn't going to, Hey, paddle yourself out. And then, uh, it, it was a, a closing moment for both of us to be able to share that moment. So I was happy to take her back. Wow. And so the producers kind of had it all planned out and they kind of planned out this meeting with the other group. Did they tell you kind of like where you had to paddle and what, or how much of it was actually a surprise meeting this group? Um, so paddling out, it was a complete surprise. The maps, if you've watched a show are so rudimentary, it's like, here's a couple of trees here. Here's a picture of a, a puma here and some caiman. That's it. Uh, but with the Amazon, it was really straightforward. I mean, it's, we were paddling upstream the entire eight hours on our first leg. And uh, then we kind of saw this cove off to the side as the sun was starting to set. And uh, that's when we saw five naked people splashing around in the water. And uh, <laughs> I mean, everything out there is just a surprise. You know, you're walking out and you, you see a snake or you see uh, some new nuts to forge. And it kind of brings you a, an excitement to life in that moment. And so seeing other people was definitely people that weren't staring at us with cameras. Uh, it was refreshing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, most people can kind of get by on 21 days, but this is a whole nother thing. What was your biggest worry going into the next 19 days? Were you worried about food or disease or. Oh, uh, or just maybe the other people like the other group and how they were going to be. No, I didn't really know what to expect, and that's what I liked. Uh, I hadn't watched a lot of the shows before. I'd watched, uh, like, a part of Matt Wright's episode because I met him in Colorado months before. Wow. Uh, but I didn't know what to expect, expect and that, that was exciting for me. Uh, I wasn't worried about really getting hurt or bugs or parasites at that point. And I don't know whether that's smart, um, but I just – it wasn't in the forethought of my thoughts. Wow. Yeah, most people would definitely be absolutely terrified. So that's, I don't know if it's smart or not either. <laughs> hmm. So let's work backwards. You spent 21 days with this girl, Melissa, who's from Michigan, which is amazing because I'm from Michigan. So I was, I didn't even know that. I watched the episodes backwards. So I watched the Exile episode. I watched this team kind of fall apart, lose a lot of people. And then you came in and you decided to stay and it was, like shocking because this group was basically falling to pieces so it was really cool but I only saw that little bit of Melissa so I went back and watched the other episode and I saw that she was from Michigan and she was very very outdoorsy and um I guess you guys found out that you were going to Ecuador three days before you went that's crazy yeah. so how did you kind of prepare for knowing that you were going to that exact place oh um, google <laughs> Yeah, uh, you, you search, you know, what kind of vegetation's out there, what do the locals eat. Um, I mean, everything's pretty basic in survival, uh, how to build a shelter, making fire. It's not rocket science. Um, and as long as you're proactive, you'll be all right. And I kind of knew that in the military. Um, if you're willing to put the work, things will provide and produce. Um, so yeah, I did a lot of Google research, um, which didn't really help any when they sent us into the jungle, we stayed at like a resort for a few days to get acclimated and learn the lay of the land, which was completely different from where we actually ended up going. So the vegetation and animals that we saw at our camp set up versus where we actually inserted completely different. We ended up being in like a swampy area where there was nothing. And uh, 
Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. I mean, you said in another interview that you really didn't watch any of the episodes because you thought it would be cheating. But I mean, I think that most people would think of that as just preparing the best that you possibly can for something like that. So what's, what's kind of the difference to you between cheating and just gathering every bit of knowledge you possibly can? Well, I wanted it to be a challenge. Uh, and so in the military, say you were going to do a shooting competition and then you go and watch the stage that you're about to shoot and you see everybody do it. And then they, in the military, they call it gaming it. So I didn't want to game it and see how somebody else built their shelter, or how they forged their food and hunted. And I don't know if it was smart looking back, but it was just kind of my military mentality going into it. I just want it to be as rugged of a challenge. And if I, if I didn't make it, I wasn't meant to make it. It was kind of the, the thought I had going into it. If I couldn't endure, if I couldn't survive, then that's what I wanted to know and to have that lesson coming out of it. Was there something going into it that you were like, if I do tap, it's going to be for this reason? Was it like uh, I knew my ranger buddies back at home, if I had have tapped, would have joked me into the ground. Um, so I, it was survive or die. Wow. <laughs> and you mentioned um, online that you never actually applied for Naked and Afraid. So you said that you got a phone call from the producers and they, they saw you on a different show. How did that go? How were you accepted? Uh, so it was like six months before I actually went for Naked and Afraid. Uh, kicking and screaming on Fox. They wanted me to be an extra for their uh, season one. And I went out to Fiji, and the day they started filming, they said, hey, we don't need you. I was like, okay, cool. Changed my plane ticket for a week from now, and I'll hang out here. So I actually went scuba diving with uh, some of the locals and went to a local village, and I was the first outsider to ever go to that village. And just hung out there for the week with the village elder. And he showed me how they built their roofs and how he hunted and uh, enjoyed it there. But when I was leaving, they said, hey, we want to get you on the show. So we'll stay in contact with you. And I guess the same production companies work with Naked and Afraid. And then six months later, they called me when I was out on the farm with my ranger buddy and asked if I wanted to go to do Naked and Afraid. Wow. And was there anyone in your life at that time that was a catalyst for you going or anything that you were like, I want to do this mission or just, just kind of random? No, uh, kind of random. I had a lot of change at that point in my life. I moved from Denver to central Virginia and just kind of in this transition period in my life and so any new change was welcomed. Wow. So let's go back to this day one that you were with Melissa. You guys really, it looked like you really struggled. Like how much of the show was the, the worst moments? I mean, was it better? And then they just only showed the worst or how did that go? Because day one looked pretty bad. You guys struggled with the bugs a lot. Yeah, day one sucked. Um, you're in a new, new place, new area, new country, new climate. Um, and we didn't get a lot of time to really walk around and get the lay of the land. So we ended up going to the highest apex. It was like this hilltop and it looked relatively clear. It was a path. And then there were some trees around. So we figured that'd be a good place to set up shelter, uh, made a raised bed and the bugs, like literally every speck of leaf grass that we had cut, they went to eat. So by the end of the night, we were covered in bugs. Our shelter fell apart. We had no fire. And there wasn't really much we could do. Even if we had overhead, the bugs still would have. I mean, if you watch in the XL, they literally entrenched our camp one night. Um, so it was just a learning, learning curve. Then the next day, we moved back down towards the water, which you wouldn't think would be a good idea. But surprisingly enough, the bugs didn't really bother us much. And the key thing was getting fire. Once we had fire, they stayed away. We had the smoke during the day that kept the mosquitoes at bay. And it was just a learning curve, but it, it sucked. It sucked. <laughs> yeah, day two, you said you kind of got pretty grumpy. And you said you either like being in charge or you like being alone, which was even better for you. So how did you deal with being with Melissa there and knowing that you guys were both trying to survive? Were you just thinking about yourself or were you trying to like take her into consideration 
Oh, it's hard watching the show versus being in the show. As in life, we have the luxuries of support from our friends and family, television, podcasts that motivate us in the mornings, uh, coffee, sugar. And when you don't have that, you kind of get outside of yourself. And when I get hungry, I get angry. Um, so by day two, all those things were really starting to set in. You're kind of going into that primal instinct, food, shelter, water, food, shelter, water. Um, and Melissa and I were complete different personalities. I was kind of the reserve military uh, type. And she was more of an upbeat spirit. And I wasn't used to being around that. And I didn't know how to respond and work cohesively with her. Um, it's another learning curve. Um, like I said, just the luxuries and amenities that we have in normal day, we take for granted how much that buffers who we could be. Mm. Uh, I mean, I work with people, you take coffee away from them for a day and they're <laughs> Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. Uh, yeah. And then so for, the, for those of you who don't know, the contestants on Naked and Afraid get to pick just one item to bring. But um, I kind of heard, I did some digging around on the internet. So I guess you get to bring four things with you and then the producers pick from those four things. So you said you picked, you brought four knives and they gave you the biggest knife. Your partner brought fishing line or something, right? Is there something mm -hmm. else that you wish that she would have brought? Oh, not for that. Not for that area. I mean, you really needed food. Uh, you needed some kind of hunting device or some kind of fishing device. Um, and I wasn't really smart in my preparation. I was kind of overconfident and cocky. Um, I think at one point I told pr production I wanted to bring a six-pack of yingling and ranger panties as my survival item. Um, so, yeah, I brought... A small knife, a hatchet, a big knife, and a medium-sized knife. Just <laughs> one knife. I felt like being a ranger in the woods, a knife would be a fitting tool. Wow. Uh, so but I was happy. That's the actual knife that you brought with you there? Yep. This is the knife. It was made by uh, Topps Knives and E.J. Snyder, another Naked and Afraid legend. He uh, worked with them to help design it. And I wanted something that would work as a knife, but would also help in cutting down trees and something that looked intimidating. Yeah, uh, I mean, how much firewood did you have to gather every day? It looked like to, to keep a fire going basically 24 hours a day, that is so much work. Yeah, we had a small little fire starter with a ferro rod, and uh, I think we lost the actual ferro rod on day seven. So it was like, we must maintain fire. That's how you procured you know your your water that you could drink uh your food that you ate everything revolved around the fire and so during the day everything was soaked and, and rotten you would have to take a wet log place it around the fire and dry that out during the day and it would create a lot of smoke and that would keep the bugs away so during the day dry out everything that was wet and at night somebody had to stay awake somebody had to sleep you had to maintain the fire then while she went fishing or while I went fishing, somebody had to stay by the fire and maintain it. So it was a constant effort. Wow. And I know on day three and four, things got pretty dramatic. And you told Melissa, we're doing two collective efforts, but I just need to be away from you right now. So I thought that was pretty funny. How much of the reactions and the emotions were really real versus did the producers ever take you aside and say, oh, get more angry or feel like this or say this? Uh, they wouldn't necessarily provoke in that manner but they would ask questions uh that would at times make me angry how's it feel that melissa caught that fish what do you mean how's it feel i'm hungry i don't care but you're my face with a camera that's making me angry and then i'd have to go back and like i said the the luxuries that we normally have not having that out there really shows you how being tired and hungry and low on natural resources uh, can make you but a lot of it was real uh, I mean if you're with somebody 24 7 whether it's your spouse your family at some point you need a break and probably day four or five is when I started really feeling that yeah so day four Melissa killed a snake actually that was crazy she just pulled it right out of the tree by the tail and chopped its head off that was insane how did you feel when she did that because i know you said you're afraid of snakes right are you still afraid of them 
Uh, so the way that they pieced together the show is that was day 18. Uh, I was in the woods chopping down one of the final logs to construct a raft, and I saw the snake. And no, I don't like snakes. So I was going back to our fire to get my uh, hunting spear, and I, she was more familiar with snakes and wilderness. And so when she learned what was going on, she said, hey, I'll grab the snake. Kudos. Thanks. Um, you know, if, if we were in the military and we had to clear a building with enemy and they're like, all right, Chance, you take point. Now, this guy got shot in the face and needs a surgical crite. She'd probably hand me the scalpel. I have more experience than that. Um, but in that situation, she felt more comfortable and it was day 18. Um, and this is a new environment, so you can study as much as you want, but when you're hungry and tired, can you properly identify what type of snake that is? Is the squeeze worth the juice? Um, she's a strong, strong girl, and uh, she went after it, and I was thankful for it. <laughs> so the necklace you wore around your neck was actually the microphone. You still wear it. Wow. Yeah. Crazy. So the crew brought in supplies for women, like feminine products and things like that. Were there anything that the crew brought in or any behind the scenes things that you guys got at all? Any luxuries or a minute under a tent or with a blanket or anything? No, uh, I would walk around in the mornings for about two hours just to clear my thoughts and see if I could find any animals or vegetation. Uh, I found a pot one time. They didn't let me keep it. I found a fishing spear that the natives have used out there that had a metal point. They didn't let me use that. And I found a lighter from production, but as soon as I found it, they took that. So. <laughs> I'd be like hiding, like digging holes, hiding my random things. Man, it's survival. <laughs> wow. but, I mean, I was very impressed with them maintaining the integrity of the, the show. Um, you would think for them to boost ratings that they would want to help you out, but they really did a phenomenal job with maintaining the integrity. And I was appreciative of that. And there are so many dangerous bugs and pumas and wild hogs out there. What was the most dangerous thing you think you came across that you were like, this thing could kill me? Oh, uh, on day 21, not really much. I mean, we had the pumas that would come around the camp at night, but with the fire there, they didn't bother us. Uh, you would hear the anaconda splash around in the water. When we were building our raft on day 19, there was like a six-foot caiman, probably 10 feet away from us, and production was in canoes around us with their cameras. They're like, splash around or something, like grab knife, uh, splash, security, check. Um Day four, oh, on the 40-day challenge, is a little bit different. Uh, we'd be hunting for the wild boar, and you'd see these trails of the anacondas, I mean, gi ginormous. And they would be actually grabbing the pigs, squeezing the life out of them, and then you'd hear the pigs squealing, and the anaconda would slam into the water. I think you can see it on one of the episodes from the 40-day challenge. Uh, and then I left the jungle with four parasites, so I guess that at some point could kill you. Uh, wow. Oh, my gosh. And you grew up afraid of the dark, right? So is this kind of, is, was there any other fears that you had going into it that you were like, this is going to be terrifying? Or are you, have you kind of worked through every fear you could think of now? Oh, uh, yeah, I think I've worked through most of them. The military really helped with, like I said on the show, you know, being afraid of the dark when you go hunt bad guys in the middle of the night and that's your job you get over the darkness really quick fear of heights jumping out of airplanes that takes care of that and fear of death the military makes sure you're not really afraid of that so i guess the only thing i'm i was and am afraid of then or failure but if you work hard and learn the effort and hard work then you don't have to worry about failure so i guess i'm not really afraid of much now <laughs> And how many times did you think about tapping out? Were there moments that you were like, I just want to go eat a sandwich or I want to just be done or I don't care what people think of me. This is TV or like how many times were you just like, maybe I should just go home? Oh, uh, I think there was one time on the 40 day challenge when they started bickering towards like day 34 through 36. that I was just like, if you guys want to continue arguing, I'll just tap and get out of here. But as far as, pain or suffering was uh 
I'd rather die than, than quit and have that stain on my conscience. Wow. That's very inspirational. You have a very unique mindset like that. And especially I know during the 40 day challenge, one of the most pivotal moments was when you went out hunting with one of the, with two of the contestants and then one of them went back to camp and you stayed there all night with this other guy. And then part of the way through the night, he actually tapped out and got to be wrapped in a blanket and left. And you were literally there freezing cold all night. You said in the morning that him leaving was actually worse than you staying out there all night. So how did you deal with that? That's just so, I just can't even imagine. Oh, I guess I was lucky in the military. You're used to going through selections and people leaving of their own accord. And in the beginning of the day, I kind of knew that was the direction he was going uh, based on our conversations. And I didn't want to leave. We had kind of built a bond between all the, people in the group and um but that was something that he had to deal with internally and I wasn't going to stop him um and I had to maintain my own composure at that point and being cold and miserable in the military you learn quickly that pain is only temporary and either I would die or I would die so I I, I don't know I guess in that moment I didn't really worry too much about it just get through the night and get to that 50 meter target. Wow. Was there something that goes through your mind, like count to 60, a hundred billion times, or like think about each part of your body or like, what do you do? Uh, for me, the Ranger Creed. So the Ranger Creed in the military is our ethos and how we operate and how we live our lives. And I would recite that to myself whenever I got down or got demotivated. And it was a way of like a personal mantra you know, I will not quit. And, uh, I would say that to myself a lot walking around and especially that night, just a way of mentally engaged. And were there things that you just missed so much? Were there people or places or foods or something that you were just like, I Mm. miss this? Uh, peanut butter. And so my wife now I met her four days before leaving. And I kept thinking, like, what kind of dates I wanted to take her on and what she was doing. And in the military, I would always look at the stars at night before we'd go on missions. So I would do that a lot. And then with the group at night, we would sit around and go through the alphabet. When I get out of Naked and Afraid, I will eat A, start with A, and work your way up to Z. And we'd do that every night. So I had the longest list of foods I wanted to eat. But it made it worth it. Like, uh, I've always wanted things that you had to work hard for not something that came easy. So like in, in the mornings do a hard workout, you feel like you earned your breakfast and I want to finish the challenge and earn everything that I'd been thinking about. And it made it kind of worked hand in hand. Well, honestly, chance for 99% of the world, they do a 20 minute workout and they feel like they've earned every single thing they could possibly eat or drink that day. So (laughs) I think that's the average mindset. But yeah, you were talking a lot on the show about Oreos and peanut butter. And you said when you got off, you actually drank the jar of peanut butter in 10 seconds. I swear, the the peanut butter companies and Oreo companies should be giving you basically unlimited peanut butter and Oreos for life. I swear. (laughs) Um, If there was anything out in the jungle that you could have had, if there was a fridge there where you could have like just stocked it full, what would you actually have eaten. I mean, I don't think you really would have taken peanut peanut butter and Oreos with you every day, right? Absolutely. (laughs) Because the worst part was being hungry. Like being hungry for that long, it really plays in your psyche. And I probably wasn't even that hungry. It's just the mental anguish of your stomach constantly talking to you. So when I left the show, like I could feel myself physically get responsive and angry to being hungry. So I walked around at food stash in my pockets and my center console, my vehicle walked around with a bag of food. I literally gained 70 pounds in the month after I left because I couldn't stop eating. And I just <laughs> didn't want to be hungry. So if I got hungry, I got angry and the people around me would let me know that. Um, it's wow. a peanut butter. I mean, you eat a big scoop of peanut butter and it gets stuck in your throat and then you feel full. That's, I wanted that taste, the texture, the sweetness, and not being hungry. Do you have a favorite type of peanut butter? Do you like creamy or crunchy or a certain brand or anything? It doesn't really matter. They're all heaven. 
<laughs> a little more. Oh my gosh. So do you still keep in touch with Melissa or anyone else from the crew? I know you, Matt Wright actually lives in Virginia too, right? So do you see him in person? Uh, so I was living in Colorado before I moved out to Virginia and that's where Matt lives. So I met him at a gun show and took one of his knives to Fiji. When I was living in the village, I gave it to the village elder. And then uh, stay in touch with EJ Snyder a lot stay in touch with Melissa a lot, but she's always traveling and busy. And I think she just did the latest XL four. So she's had her hands full. Um, but we all stay pretty tight knit family. Um, everybody's got their hands in other pots and constantly on the go. So we stay in touch as much as we can. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about kind of your background and family life. I think there's so much depth to you as a person that I feel like, just that little bit of naked and afraid just doesn't tell us enough. So um, tell me about Boys Home. Tell me about what it is and how you got involved with that. Uh, so Boys Home, it's a nonprofit, uh, but more importantly, it was founded in 1906 for at-risk youth uh, in Southwest Virginia. And I came to Boys Home in 1998. I was 11 years old. My mother was incarcerated at the time and was just looking for a safe place to put me. So this is a school that's in the mountains um, and it removes the outside distractions, but gives families that are impoverished or dealing with difficulties to place their, their boys in an environment that will help them grow spiritually, mentally, and physically. So I was there for about two years and it was one of the greatest parts of my childhood where I just remember people caring about me unconditionally providing for me. I didn't have to worry about where my meals were coming from. I was educated. Uh, we spent a lot of time in, in the woods, boy scouts, lots of activities. And, uh, after I left boys home, it was about 13 and it was just nothing but foster care and group homes till about my last few years in high school. Um, and as I was moving from Denver, to Virginia, I wanted to stop through and visit and see the campus. I hadn't been there in almost 18 years and just get some kind of resemblance from my past, something that was positive for my childhood. And I stopped in just thinking to stay for 10 minutes. And at that point, I ran into the associate program director, who was also in the Army. He was an infantry officer, and he was a student when I was there on campus. So we sat down, chat about life real quick, and at the end of the conversation, he asked, hey, do you want to work here? So I told him, hey, I'm, you know, leaving for this TV show, but once I get back, I would love to work here. So after I got back from Naked and Afraid, uh, three months later, you know, Parasite's gone, put on some weight, uh, started working there again. And it was funny, because on day 20, uh, the producers, I was like, hey, you have to call boys home and let them know that I'm still interested in the job. Uh, so they called and reached back to him, told him I was doing fine and that I'd be staying for 20 more days. How, I know Boys Home, you know, you said you don't have to fight for the food on your, or the clothes on your back. You don't have to worry about food and things like that. How was it growing up? Like what, what led your mom to realize that that was the best choice for you? So before that, my dad left my mother when I was three months old. So it was just her and I. Uh, then she remarried a veteran he was a Marine in the Tet Offensive in Vietnam, so a lot of strong post-traumatic stress disorder. And I lived with him for a few months in Oakland, California, right before going to Boys Home. My first week living with him, he gave me $10 and told me I had to be a man and make my own living. So I made a lemonade stand, and I would make enough each day just to go to a Chinese buffet midday, fill up, get full. And that would carry me through the day. I'd hang out with the homeless in downtown Oakland and we'd go to the cafes and bakeries that would throw out expired food and we'd eat that. And so going to boys home, not having to find my own food, that's what made that a pleasant experience. And my mother throughout her life, I guess she's been involved in embezzlement. And so that's why she went to prison. Then she's in prison still for embezzling again. And my father is serving a life sentence. Uh, so not a lot of uh, parental involvement and just being placed in situations where I had to find my own food um, and placed in dangerous situations and having to fend for myself. Not worrying about that at boys' home made it up. Uh, and having people that cared about me. 
I mean, I could get in trouble. I was freaking one of the worst kids there. Uh, but even after I messed up, the staff would still love me and care about me. And that spoke volumes, not so much then, because I hated being there then, but leaving and knowing how to, to do chores, knowing how to make my bed, knowing how to work hard, um, having those lessons instilled in me, I was super appreciative going into the military and as an adult. Yeah. Yeah. I actually had my son really young and I went to an alternative school and it was definitely different. And the people around you, you know, you're all, you all have these traumatic different experiences yourself. So it's kind of like a, a group effort, but their only rule was if you left for the day, you couldn't come back that same day. So I remember people would just be screaming and yelling and fighting or whatever. And they would walk out the door and the, all the staff would ever say was hope to see you tomorrow. And that was just like the best thing. I don't know. They gave you so much more respect and it was just like you know you have to make your own choices and we understand you can't be here today but I hope you can come back tomorrow and that really I think gave people a lot of strength to actually come back were there other people around you your friends and things like that that had a similar pretty bad situations at the time yeah a lot of the kids there were sent by the courts uh you had really impoverished families that would send their children there and boys home doesn't ask the the, I mean, the parents really pay pennies to dollars on what Boys Home provides for the students. Um, so during my time versus now, I believe it was a lot worse as far as the family situations. And did you learn things there? You said you were a Boy Scout. So did you start, did you know things before you started going there that you basically now took on Naked and Afraid or did you learn everything there as a Boy Scout? I uh, learned a lot there. We learned knots. We learned how to build shelter, how to build fire. We would camp out a lot. Later in the month, we're doing a three-day, 35-mile hike. Um, so we really put the boys to work, and the mountains make men. And uh, between that and ranger school and the military, uh, survival is just basic tasks put together with a mindset and the ability and will to survive. So did you go into the military right when you were 18? Were you waiting for that? Were you excited about that? Or were you just kind of like, oh, this is a random option? Or did a lot of the other boys home boys go into the military? Uh, the, the military was something that I wanted to do. I uh, did a year of college. And then after that, um, I was paying for it all on my own. My mom didn't really contribute to the finances as far as for college. Um, and I was working at a group home in, in Richmond, uh, working in a nightclub as a bouncer and then working as a receptionist at the college and did some summer classes, put me over my budget. And as I was going to get a poster board to make a, the merit, merit system for the boys at the group home, ran into this guy. He had a ranger tab on, strong chisel jaw, upright stature. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I want to be like that. Uh, so we chatted up a conversation and Two weeks later, I shipped out as a combat medic. And then once I got to the beginning parts of the military, they offered me a ranger contract for having a really good PT score. And it was all history after that. So how many years did you spend in the military? And you said you ended up being a, ra a ranger battalion, right? So what exactly yeah. does that mean? How does that process go? How do you become that? So I did four years active. I was a ranger regiment, which is a direct action mission. Uh, where they do a lot of kill capture missions. Uh, and I was a special operations medic for Ranger Regiment. And after four years, I went and did security contracting in Afghanistan uh, for about three years. And same thing, just a paramedic on a security mobile team. Um, but most of my adult life yeah, has been working in foreign countries with weapons and either going after bad guys or stopping bad guys from hurting good guys. And did you feel like going into it, you were more prepared than the other people or did you feel kind of the same? Like everyone was shocked and had no idea what to do or how did you, how did you, how did you like, were you even with the other people or did you have a better tougher mind from going through everything you've been through? Oh, uh, childhood definitely prepared me. You know, I wasn't used to being a name called or, uh, I did sports growing up, so the physical portion wasn't really that tough. And uh, having a strong mindset is what got me through my childhood. And it definitely contributed to my success in the military. But learning how to work as a team, that was a struggle for me in the military and obviously on the show. 
Um, it's just something <laughs> that you have to, to learn learn to use what you bring to the table and help everybody contribute to the overall mission. And you said the military taught you how to toughen up your feet, walking barefoot and using alcohol on them. And what else did the military taught you as, teach you as far as survival goes? As far as survival, just being proactive. I mean, uh, you could sit on your butt and sit by the fire and have the com comfort and luxuries, but the military teaches you how to be comfortable in uncomfortable situations. And if you can do that, you can put yourself in action. You'll find food, you'll find water, you'll build your shelter. If you can take one step, you can make it up the mountain. Um, and that mentality isn't something that you get from a book. It's not something you get from a four day course. It's not something you get from, you know, watching YouTube videos. That's something that you have to put yourself in the fire, put yourself in life experiences and you gain over time. Same as muscle. You, you can't just go to the gym for a week and expect to have the body that you want. It takes time to build that. So the military is where that started and it pumped me the process. And in that process, I repeated it over time. You know, a lot, you see a lot of people doing Spartan races and different physical challenges and it, it puts yourself in an uncomfortable situation and you learn how to work out of that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it seems like you're kind of still on the show, at least you were still dealing with a lot of the mental demons that you had from being in the military. A lot of the challenges, are you still working through that or how have you worked through that since being out? Um, I guess it's an ongoing battle. Uh, so I had a lot of issues, I would say, going into the military. I was very aggressive. I was very angry. And then you go out and you're going after bad guys. Like, uh, So I found myself very hypervigilant, uh, and I felt guilty. And I didn't really know how to release that. And I didn't know how to associate with people that weren't military uh, and didn't have those shared experiences. So I really kind of confined myself. And it's taken a while to learn how to assimilate. Yeah. Do you see that with a lot of other veterans? How do they, how do they come back and how do they start to get back to normal? Uh, I mean, it just depends on your experiences and combat in my opinion is different than just serving in the military. Uh, when you're asked to go out night after night and go after bad guys and without forethought of your own life, you know, going out, doing kill capture missions puts you in a very specific mindset and the way you think and the things you think about and how you operate changes. No other job if I had to take a picture in case I get killed that they can put and send it to my family or had to write a will to this job that I'm working. Um, so it just depends on your experiences and your mentality. Uh, the government's getting better with creating programs for veterans that are leaving the military, but Combat experience definitely rewires the way you think and operate, and it takes time and support. Well, it's great that you have support now. You have your wife, right? And you have a baby on the way, right? Yeah, little ranger, Colt Stonewall Davis, we're going to call him. Aw, I love that. So how did you actually meet your wife? Uh, so the week before I left for Naked Afraid, I did a 12 hour Spartan race. Uh, one of my buddies I contracted with, he was a former Marine recon and he was cadre for a Spartan race. So I did that. And as I was leaving the race, uh, I met my wife on Tinder. I was like, Hey, I know I've been blowing you off so I could practice being in the woods last week, but just meet me for a beer. And we met at a bar, closed the bar down. And as soon as she walked in, I was just like starstruck. And uh, we had a couple more dates that week. And I told her, I was like, hey, I'm leaving for the jungle. And this is crazy. I just met you. Uh, wait for me, maybe. And so she was supposed to pick me up from the airport on the 21 day. So the producers called her and was like, hey, he's staying for 20 more days. She's like, I knew it. And uh, then on day 40, she picked me up and took me out to eat. And it was magic ever since. Aw, I love that. What a great story. <laughs> was going through all the Naked and Afraid challenges with Melissa, did you come home with a lot of, a lot more experience of how to deal with women? Or what did you learn that you, that you take into your marriage now? 
Mm, so my wife now, her pet peeve was and is passive aggressive. I was very passive aggressive. So I got to work through that with Melissa. And then in the girls on the 40 day, definitely helped me even more so with not being passive aggressive. Um, and just learning how females think, you know, I hadn't really spent a lot of time closely with females and learning how to talk their language and how to operate. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Do you think that she would ever go on Naked and Afraid? Uh, I think so. I mean, she hasn't really had a strong background in, in wilderness and being outdoors, but she played collegiate sports and still play sports now 26 weeks into the pregnancy uh so strong athlete strong minded and you know we, we do a lot of hiking and camping now so i think she'd be fun so with everything how you've grown up and everything that you've learned what do you think is really important that you're going to teach your child for my son um you know i'm not really concerned about what he does or what he wants to be as long as he's a man of character uh, it's important that I instill values and honor into who he becomes and that he becomes a contributing member to his, his nation and his countrymen. Um, you know, he, he'll go with me when I do things, shooting, fighting, boxing, wrestling. So I'm sure he'll do soccer with the wife. Um, but the, all the, those things are little compared to who his heart and his character come to be. Well, how old do you think he'll be before you take him out for a night of survival in the in the wilderness? Mm, it depends on when the wife lets me. Uh, pretty, pretty early on. I still haven't figured out, can you put protein powder in formula? Well, I'm sure it'll be pretty early on with him strapped to my back and us going, going on hikes. Oh my gosh, that's so awesome. Do you teach other people right now survival skills or do classes or anything? Uh, you know, after the show, the attention was great, but uh, I don't really like it too much. So I pretty, I say pretty tight knit with just the boys home. So we'll go on a lot of camping trips, hiking trips, do survival classes, do first aid classes. Uh, keep it limited to that. I mean, you know, I find so much purpose and passion in my job. I like giving back to them and just stuff it all my time there. So you don't want to go on the Kim Kardashian show? What's that? <laughs> Who yeah. is she? That's the best answer ever. <laughs> so is there anywhere in the world that you would want to travel that's luxurious if you got any amazing trips or anything like that? Brazil. Really? Brazil, Australia, and China. Mm. And you said you've been to San Diego, right? Yep. Went to San Diego when I was doing security work. I spent some time vacationing out there. I mean, fish tacos, I got to get back to Pacific Beach. Uh, the nightlife in San Diego was, was amazing. Uh, I had some phenomenal sushi there by the Hard Rock Cafe Hotel. Um, but a lot of good buddies in the Navy community that live out there, so I'd love to get back to San Diego. Do you remember any of the nightlife, any of the bars or restaurants you went to? Mm -mm. That's how good of a time it was. That's awesome. Was there anything that you didn't do that you've heard of in San Diego that if you came back, you would want to do again? Mm, no, I'd be open to the suggestion. All right. Well, you'll have to check out our website because we have a lot. <laughs> we actually are publishing our 300th story in just a few days. So that's awesome. We're basically all about what to do and see in San Diego and the experiences and a lot of videos. So this interview is going to be awesome and we actually have a shooting range out in Paula which is really cool I took my son there for a shooting class and basic basic firearm skills and I actually I uh, got got a lot of backlash from that for trying to teach my son some new skill so I don't think that we're the wilderness type here in San Diego but what are your thoughts right. on, on taking kids out and sh shooting and learning how to do that uh, it's, you got to start somewhere. Um, so we expect our nation to be protected and to have a, a nation that can defend for itself. It, it starts at the lowest level. I mean, you really have to bring up the next generation of of strong countrymen that, that are going to 
defend. Uh, I mean, my son's going to be shooting probably six, eight years old. Uh, and it's important to instill the firearm safety. And uh, Yeah, I'm, I'm all for it. That's awesome. Was well, there anything else that you want to tell our San Diego readers? Anything that you want to leave them with as far as, do you think that anyone can just do, go out and do Naked and Afraid? Do you think you were very much ready for that and not very many other people would be? Or do you think it's something that everyone should try if they get a chance? I mean, Well, it just depends on the person. Uh, for a lot of people, they want to prove themselves as hunters or a survivalist or uh, test their grit. No, you learn a lot of things in a win, but you learn a lot more in a loss. And as long as you can count that loss as a lesson learned, you're always winning. Uh, so even me coming back from it, I learned a lot of things that I need to brush up on and things that I need to work on. Um, so it just depends on the person and what they want in a life. Wow. Well, we'd love to have your family out and we'll have the peanut butter and Oreos ready for you guys if you come and we'd have be happy to have you out here in San Diego. So thank you so much for taking the time out of your day. I know you got to get back to a lot of wilderness stuff you got going on. So thank you so Absolutely. much for doing this interview. It was really fun. Well, thank you for having me.